This message is entitled, The Triunity of God, and is given by Dr. Earl Rodmacher. Today, we dig a little deeper. We go into the doctrine of the triunity of God and the decree of God. And I'm going to rest pretty heavily on using a lot of scripture in the second one especially and also in the first. And in each case, we'll start, as usual, with a definition, work our way through that, and then move into a development of the doctrine. So the first hour, this hour, the triunity of God. Now, probably you have more often heard of the term Trinity, and but for our discussion today, probably it is more accurate to express the three in oneness by the word triunity. So for our purposes, we just will be as accurate as possible. Roman numeral one, the introduction, and A under that definition. There are many, many fine statements of the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going to use the one done by Ralph Wardlaw in his book, Lectures on Theology. And I'll read the whole thing through and then read it through a couple more times more slowly. While there is only one divine nature, there are three subsistences or persons called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who possess not a similar, but the same numerical essence, one. And the distinction between them is not merely nominal, but real. The whole definition again. While there is only one divine nature, There are three subsistences or persons called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost who possess not a similar but the same numerical essence. And the distinction between them is not merely nominal but real. Now, secondly, in the introduction, B, the meaning of personality as used of the members of the Godhead. The meaning of personality, in quotes, as used of the members of the Godhead. What do we mean by person, personality? The members of the Godhead are commonly referred to as persons or subsistences. That presupposes the quality of personality. Personality, in turn, presupposes the power of Self-consciousness and self-determination. Self-consciousness and self-determination. So that a personality is a distinct individual existence which has the properties of reason and free will. Self-consciousness, self-determination, personality. This we mean by a person. And it goes without saying that it also includes all of those attributes of the Godhead which belong to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, C. The origin and character of the doctrine. There's no analogy to the Trinity. There is no way of saying, you know, it is like that or like that. For it is not like anything or anyone absolutely but we don't learn about the Trinity from experience we don't learn about the Trinity from discovery the knowledge of the Trinity is learned exclusively by revelation now that does not mean it is unreasonable as we will seek to show a little bit later but we do not learn of it basically from reason. We learn of the Trinity by revelation. And probably the key verse in the New Testament of the revelation of the Trinity is Matthew 28, 19. Having gone, therefore, disciplize all nations by baptizing them in 
the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, plural. Singular name, the plural person. It might be good to just digress for a moment here to explain the statement that is made in this little deal again, Don't Stop Now, put out by the Pentecostal Students Fellowship International, which is basically Jesus only or is Unitarian with regard to Jesus. On their three steps of destiny, repent, desire to change your life, and don't stop, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and then it says, not Father, Son, Holy Ghost, what is the name, Matthew 28, 19. And what they are doing is relating to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Probably be good for you to look at that. In Acts chapter 2, remember Peter is preaching to those who have crucified Christ. And he's really laying it on them heavy as he says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. And they are gripped by that, and they say, what shall we do if we crucified the Messiah? Then what hope is there left for us? And Peter says unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, or because of the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Jesus-only people take Acts 2.38 as being expressive of the fact that the name in Matthew 28.19 is the name Jesus. And they become modalists. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are modes of the existence of the one person, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Now, the clarification of those two verses is very simple. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the word in is the Greek preposition upon. The preposition epi equals upon, and it's talking about the authority by which they come. They have crucified Christ. Now, they need to see that the proper demonstration of their change of mind is their new idea with regard to Jesus Christ. So now you come upon the name of Jesus Christ. You come claiming Jesus Christ. You come by his authority. Whereas when you go to Matthew 28, 19, Having gone, therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There, the preposition is N equals in or in the sphere of. And there he gives you the full baptismal formula, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when he's talking about the sphere of our baptism, it's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you're talking about the authority or the basis upon which you come, it's the person of Jesus Christ. And this is the reason for the difference between the two. It is not a basis for developing some kind of Unitarianism of Jesus. Now, we suggested to you that as to the origin and character, then, it's entirely by revelation. It is not known by analogy, for there is no analogy to it. However, even though there is no analogy to the Trinity, we all seek to develop our analogies of the Trinity. And probably there is no place that does any better job of it than Addison Leach's book, Interpreting Basic Theology. Leach, L-E-I-T-C-H, Addison, A-D-D-I-S-O-N, Addison Leach, in the book Interpreting Basic Theology. This is a helpful book to have because it takes a lot of areas of theology and deals with them in a very practical way. He has several pages here, beginning with page 26, to show that the Trinity really is not just a puzzle to confuse people's minds, but rather that God has given to us here a clue to the interpretation of the universe. 
and he goes into uh, philosophy and psychology and physics and so on and so forth to show in each one of these disciplines that there is always the concept of the one and the many, the one and the many, and the one and the many, and how the, the idea of the Trinity really fits reality as we see it in each of these other disciplines. And if some of your minds run along those lines and you'd like to investigate more deeply, I would suggest to you that you can find a good discussion in Leach's book. So he says the Trinity is the ultimate clue, not the ultimate puzzle, that God is really showing us true unity in the one out of the many. And then he goes on to say something concerning the analogies. He says this is a good practice so long as we also understand that no analogy can be a complete description or definition. One analogy frequently used is a three-leaf clover, one plant, three parts. But we see immediately what the trouble is here. The clover has three parts, but the three parts are not one, so our analogy falls to the ground. Another helpful analogy is that of the sun in the sky. The sun has its lodgment in the heavens. It reveals itself in the light on the earth. It works in the energies of the heat, which we cannot see. Three things, lodgment in the heavens, light on the earth, energies of heat, which we cannot see. Thus, we have only one thing located in a given place, made known to us visibly, the word made flesh, and energizing us with unseen power, that would be the spirit. The illustration serves us in making clear how one thing is known through another, but it would be hard to say that the heat of the sun is fully sun, as we say the Spirit of God is fully God. Another helpful analogy describes a woman and her three functions as daughter, wife, and mother. She is only one person, but exhibits herself in three different ways or modes. Some would call this modalism. Her father knows her as daughter, her husband as her wife, her son as his mother. It is not that she turns on, so to speak, one aspect or another of her being. She remains just herself. But in her variety of relationships, she is known in three different ways. If you can picture her sitting at the table at the evening meal, perhaps her thoughts turned inward on private contemplation, you will recognize that her father, husband, and son are reacting to her in three different ways, knowing her in a particular office. Others have taken the water, H2O, water comes in three forms, a solid, a vapor, and a liquid. But again, that exhibits the three, but really in a modalistic form rather than in a Trinitarian form. So that leads to fourth thing under introduction, the errors to avoid. Throughout the history of the church, there have been many, many erroneous statements of the Trinity. But I believe that you could summarize them all under two statements or two categories of error. On the one hand, there are those who have been guilty of tritheism. Tritheism. And that would be the three gods error. Basically, it would be a denial of the unity of the essence of God. Tritheism would be a denial of the unity of the essence of God. On the other hand, and more frequently, error manifests itself in some form of modalism, rather than tritheism, modalism. Historically, for example, there were patropathianism, that is, the suffering of the Father on the cross, Sabellianism that was similar to it that came from Sabellius, Unitarianism, as you know it more today, are all forms of modalism. And the modalist would deny the reality of the person of the Godhead. The Jesus only, another case in point. The modalist would deny the reality of the persons of the Godhead. He sees a trinity of revelation rather than a person. So that the trinity to him is merely differing revelations 
of the same God, not really person, not distinct personality. Bartianism really is very close to modalism, Bartian theology, neo-orthodox theology, which tends to be modalism of Christ, where Christ becomes the central feature and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aspects are merely revelatory rather than real. They're merely nominal rather than real. So these two categories of error have been true throughout history. Errors to avoid. Okay? Number two. Roman numeral two, the defense of the doctrine. We want to defend the doctrine first from reason and then from revelation. And for the defense of the doctrine from reason, I want to give six statements, six points, from Schaeffer's Systematic Theology, C-H-A-F-E-R, Systematic Theology, Volume 1, pages 289 to 297. Schaeffer's Systematic Theology, A Defense from Reason, and you'll need to think through with me on these six items. Starting with basic things that we understand and know. Number one, the divine attributes are eternal. None are derived, none are acquired, for that would make God incomplete and dependent at some point, and therefore not God. So the first thing we start with is the attributes of God, some of which we talked about yesterday, are eternal. Secondly, the divine attributes are eternally active. And that would be especially true with the communicable attributes, the love of God. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have exhibited love one to another from all eternity. The divine attributes are eternal. The eternal attributes are eternally active. Third, the attributes require both agent and object. That is, if you have attributes which are eternal and which are eternally active, then that eternal action of the divine attributes requires an agent and an object. It requires an object to receive the action of the attribute. If you're going to love, then there needs to be an agent to the love and an object of the love. So that the eternally active divine attributes require an agent and an object. Four, God is self-sufficient. That is, God does not need anything outside himself to be complete. God is self-sufficient. And thus, there must be within God that which corresponds to agent and object. God does not have to have something outside of himself to fulfill the eternally active attribute. God is able to fulfill it within himself. Therefore, because God is self-sufficient, the agent and the object that are necessitated by an eternally active attribute must be within God. Five, the agent and the object are person. That is, this plurality that we're talking about of agent and object cannot relate to the essence of God, for the Bible says the essence of God is numerically one. God is one. He is one in his essence. Therefore, the plurality of the agent and the object within God cannot relate to the essence of God. It must relate to person within God, capable of expressing the attributes one to another. And that would, by the way, rule out these being merely offices or modes of administration. For if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are merely modes of administration, then there could not be the agent-object relationship. Six, 
Morality in God is a trinity. Why? Because apart from a trinity, you could not experience all the experiences that are potential in the attributes. For example, without three, you could not have conjoint activity as well as individual activity. If there are only two, you'd have to have an individual agent, individual object. If there are three, you can have two acting conjointly toward one acting individually. You don't need to have four to act conjointly, but you must have more than two. So that in order to experience all of the experiences, you would have to have three. All right, think that whole thing through again. The attributes of God are eternal. The eternal attributes of God are eternally active. Love is active, eternally. In order to have an eternally active attribute, you have to have an agent and an object. Because God is self-sufficient, that agent and object must be within God. God is not dependent on anything outside of himself to meet his need. Therefore, the agent-object relationship must be within God. Because God is numerically one in his essence, the agent-object could not refer to his essence, it being one, but must refer to person. These persons could not be merely modes of operation, for if it's merely one God with three modes of operation, he is at any one time acting in one of those modes, therefore there could not be an agent-object relationship. The plurality within the self-sufficient Godhead must be a trinity in order to experience conjoint activity of an agent toward an individual object. That's the defense of the doctrine from reason, according to Schaefer. And I think it makes good sense. If it doesn't meet your categories, then you'll have to go to the next point, defense from revelation. Defense from Revelation, secondly, while the preceding material is helpful to some in demonstrating that the doctrine of the Trinity is not unreasonable, the ultimate source of authority, of course, is the Holy Scripture. And therefore, we want to move under the defense from Revelation, number one, the scriptural proof of the doctrine. And in dealing with the scriptural proof of the doctrine, we want to start first with the unity of God. The unity of God is the indispensable starting point in the Word of God. Interestingly enough, as you begin with the Old Testament, you find the Hebrews with their Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And that was stated twice a day publicly in a polytheistic society. So that Israel was a monotheistic religion in the midst of a polytheistic society. And that is one of the items of special revelation as seen in the nation of Israel itself. A monotheistic faith in a polytheistic society. Therefore, when you look at the Old Testament, you are not going to see clear, graphic portrayals of the Trinity. For well, that is not what the Old Testament is seeking to teach. It is teaching, basically, the unity of God. However, interestingly enough, the unity of God in the Old Testament is not taught in such a way as to be antithetical to the doctrine of the Trinity. 
For example, to take Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, you have an interesting use of the word one before Lord. In Hebrew, there are two words for one. One of those words is echad, E-C-H-A-D, which means a united one. And yakid is an absolute one. When you go back to Genesis, the early chapter speaking about man and woman, God says he took male and female and made them one. And there you have an ekad, a united one. Obviously, he couldn't make them one here. So they are a united one. Yaqid would be an absolute one. So in Deuteronomy 6.4, when it says, The Lord our God is one Lord, it uses the word for united one. And if you want to note an interesting quotation, Lorraine Bettner B-O-E-T-T-N-E-R, in his book, Studies in Theology, has an article on the Trinity in which he quotes a Jewish writer, Maimonides, who portrays the problem that the Jews had with Deuteronomy 6.4, for they could not get away in their thinking from the plurality that seemed to be inherent in the statement of unity. Know you that the Lord our God is one Lord, so that you have unity in plurality in the key statement of unity for the Jew in the Old Testament. That's one example of the germ form of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Again, you see it in the plural pronouns in Genesis 1. 26, for example, the plural pronouns used with the singular verbs. And God said, let us make man in our image. Plural, us, singular verb. Again, in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7, come, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Again, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, and particularly if you compare verse 3 with verse 8, in Isaiah 6, 3, speaking of King Isaiah's vision of the Lord sitting upon the throne, and the seraphim crying one to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then if you go down to verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? So that you have the triune ascription of praise in verse 3, Holy, 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 and then the plural pronoun in verse 8. These are some of the evidences of the germ form of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Also you have the pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ, so that on some occasions you will have the angel of the Lord being called God in a passage and at the same time being distinguished from God in the same passage. So that you have the angel of the Lord as God being distinguished from God in the same passage. An example of that would be Genesis 16, verses 7 to 13. Another evidence of the plurality of God in the Old Testament is in the Hebrew word Elohim. Some put more stock in this than others. The word Elohim, the plural ending, I am, to some, is an evidence of plurality in the Trinity in the Old Testament. So much for the Old Testament evidence of the Trinity. The New Testament, obviously, is much clearer, and the reason for it is that you have a potential problem on your hand, for you have Jesus Christ present now, visibly present, as one who is God. And you also have the Spirit of God coming on the scene as one who is God. So now you have God the Father who is God, God the Son who is God, and God the Holy Spirit who is God, and there thereby needed to be some kind of an explanation of the three who are God without destroying the unity of God. 
And interestingly enough, there was never any defensiveness on the part of the biblical writers with regard to the Trinity. They never felt that now I'm in a box, I've got to explain something, but rather they seemed to feel that the New Testament doctrine of the Trinity was a very logical outgrowth of the Old Testament doctrine of the unity of God. So that in the New Testament you find statements such as this. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, you have the baptism of Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And there you have Jesus incarnate being baptized. You have God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove lighting upon him. You have the voice from heaven, the voice of the Father speaking, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. There you have the three persons of the Trinity active at one and the same time. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And then you have the New Testament evidence of Matthew 28, 19, the baptismal formula, which we have already related to, the single name and the triune personage, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6, you have a good demonstration of the Trinity, where he is speaking about the tools that God has given for believers to use in the gift, the place of ministry of the gift, and the energy of God operative through the gift in the place of ministry. Notice verses 4, 5, and 6 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations or ministries of the gifts, but the same Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God who worketh all and in all. So you have God the Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father. God the Spirit giving the gift, God the Son assigning the place of the ministry of the gift, and God the Father giving the energy operative through the gift in the place of ministry. Three in one. Same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one. Again in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, you have the well-known benediction that is often used, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And again in 1 Peter 1, 2, you have the three persons in their works manifested. So these are specific New Testament evidences of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now secondly, under the defense of the doctrine from Revelation, First, we have the scriptural proof of the doctrine from the Old and the New Testament. Now, the theological statement of the doctrine. Basically, what we have said theologically are these two things. We have said that there is in the divine being one indivisible essence. We must never divide the essence of God. Secondly, there are three individual subsistences or persons and these three persons are never to be confounded we must never divide the essence we must never confound the person three persons one essence and therefore within the trinity there is the i u he relationship i u he the personal relationships within the trinity now, in that kind of a definition, we have described what is called, theologically, you might run across the term, the ontological trinity. All that that means is the trinity of being. Ontology is being. So when someone talks about the ontological trinity, they're talking about the trinity of being, whereby they are co-equal, co-eternal, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in person, one in essence. Now, when you come to the Word of God and see the unfolding of the Trinity, you find what is spoken of as an economical Trinity. And when you speak of the economical Trinity, you find the word or the idea of submission, so that you find that the Son is generated by the Father. 
the eternal generation of the Son, the eternal begetting, the only begotten Son. So the Son is spoken of as being begotten by the Father. And when you come to the Holy Spirit, he is spoken of as being sent by the Father and the Son. So you speak of the generation of the Son and the procession of the Holy Spirit. When you come to a practical unfolding of that in 1 Corinthians 11, for example, which we were talking about yesterday, God says that Christ is in subjection to the Father, man is in subjection to Christ, woman is in subjection to man. Now, the distinction here should help you in the human relationships. Just as Christ is not less than God the Father, so woman is not less than man in that third verse of 1 Corinthians 11. But just as Christ the Son exercises a submission to the Father, so woman is in submission to man. It is an economic relationship, not an ontological relationship. It is not a relationship of being, of lesser in being, but a relationship of economy. So that God says, just as the Son is in submission to the Father, so woman is in submission to man in the economy of the outworking of God's purpose. That is not an eternal relationship. That is a temporal outworking of God's purpose. So much for the theological statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. A couple of practical suggestions in conclusion. Because of the way the Bible handles the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we need to be sure that we relate ourselves to the Trinity properly. Because Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God and the one who has tabernacled among us, we tend to become absorbed with Christ. And there's good reason for that. But we need to check ourselves as well and see what our understanding of the Father is, as well as our understanding of the Spirit. Now, there are many who have said that the Spirit of God was void in the theology of many people, and that is true. Now, today, more people are beginning to understand the work of the Holy Spirit with regard to men. And as you plug into your mind truth, you're going to find yourself better related to the Word of God. For example, when you come to John 15, Christ begins by saying, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he lifteth up. And every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. So there you have the Father mentioned, and he and he. And yet, most people going through John 15 never deal with the Father at all. And then you get to verse 3, and he says, Now you are clean. Now you have had a mental catharsis through the word which I have spoken unto you. So the word becomes the pruning shears that the Father uses as the divine husbandman to prune my life. So that the omniscient, omnipotent God, the Father, is the one who is the pruner in my life and uses the word of God to do that. A practical exhibition of it. One other practical observation. Many people find themselves praying today to the Son and to the Spirit. And I'm sure that God does not get all uptight about that. But I'm also sure that the Lord Jesus, when he was asked his disciples how they ought to pray, did not speak haphazardly when he gave them instructions as to how to pray. And he said, after this manner pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Prayer was to be addressed to the Father as the architect of the plan of salvation. And later on he says, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. It doesn't say to ask him, 
you're still following through the pattern that Jesus set up, ask the Father, but what's your basis for asking? What right do you have to come? You come by the authority of the Son. And who always carries through for us, who is always the active agent of the Trinity? It is always the Holy Spirit. So that we address the Father by the authority of the Son, through the agency of the Spirit of God. Now, I'm sure that we don't have to have some kind of a mechanical format for that. But at least the Lord would have us understand the basis and the direction and the right and the power and so forth that we have to come to the throne of God. So it should help us to keep in balance in our practical Christian life the doctrines of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. So much for the doctrine of the Trinity.